It's just, it's one of those Sabbaths, I, I feel this way quite often, where I feel like a sermon is kind of anticlimactic. I mean, we've had great music, we've prayed together, and now yeah, we have to, this, this is a formality, so let, let's, let's get through this. There's a hike this afternoon, by the way, so we, let's look forward to that. Um, and uh, yes, may God bless us today. So the reading uh, that we just heard uh, from Barry, just prior to that conversation, it's helpful for a little bit of context that just the day before this, uh, Jesus had that infamous scene of going into the temple and overturning the tables and casting out the money changers. So it's now he returns, in effect, to the scene of the crime the next day. And the priests, who are the people who are in charge of the temple, <laughs> ask him quite reasonably, by what authority are you doing these things, right? You come in here as if this is your house. By what authority do you do these things? In other words, the leaders are asking, are you a self-appointed Messiah? Or is your authority from God? Is your power from heaven? Or is it from human origin? That's their question to Jesus. Is your authority from heaven? Or is it, from, is it of human origin? So Jesus turns the question around on them and asks them the same question about John the Baptist. Where did his authority come from? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I'll tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? You see, Jesus is sharing in the credibility of John the Baptist, who was popular. And Jesus is saying, if you believed in him, then you ought to believe in me as well. Treat us as one and the same. So if you're questioning my authority, then question his authority because they are interconnected. So when Jesus puts this question back at them, they argue amongst themselves. Because if we say, they say to each other, if we say John came from heaven, then he will say to us, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say he's of human origin, then we are afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as a prophet. So here Jesus has caught them in their hypocrisy because they don't believe in John the Baptist. They didn't follow his way of repentance, but they're too afraid to admit that because they know that John is popular among the people. So Jesus' question is challenging them to pick a side. You can't play both sides anymore. Either you're with me or you're against me. Jesus says they are excuse me, they're being challenged to come clean of their hypocrisy. If they believe in John, then they need to accept Jesus. If they don't believe in John, they need to be willing to admit that. He's challenging their, their dual identity. They're being good uh, politicians, right? A political answer is an answer that won't offend either side, and that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to play both sides. So the answer, we don't know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. They fail to meet the challenge. They fall back on their ambiguity, their hypocrisy, their politicalness. They try to live this double life. But what God cannot tolerate, and that's what we're going to talk about this morning, what God cannot tolerate is hypocrisy. Lukewarmness, we might say. Be one or the other. Be with me or against me. What Jesus cannot tolerate are those who don't practice what they preach. Notice carefully, two chapters from now, in Matthew 23, Jesus says, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. Therefore, do whatever they teach you and follow it. Now, this might come as a little bit of a surprise, because we think of the Pharisees and the scribes as the bad guys the guys that are always butting heads with Jesus. But Jesus says they sit in Moses' seat. They have Moses' authority. Whatever they tell you to do, do it. Their problem with, Jesus' problem with the Pharisees is not in what they say, but it's the fact that they don't follow what they teach. He adds, do not do as they do, for they do not practice what they teach. 
The problem with Pharisees is not in what they're saying, it's that they didn't follow through. They didn't practice what they preached. So Jesus compares them to dirty dishes. And this is such a poignant picture. Uh, as a, a, a single guy who lives alone, I know something about dirty dishes, right? Uh, you know, I remember when I first had my own apartment uh, living alone, um, you know, dishes pile up in the sink. And there was one, it was a Tupperware container. This really sticks in my mind. There's a Tupperware container that had just a little bit of spaghetti sauce in the bottom, on the sides, and it eventually gets covered up with other things until I come time to, you know, clean things out. And that whole container had been filled with this blue green fuzz. It was just, it was like hair. It was incredible, right? And it's so, it's so disgusting that it's like, you don't even want to get close enough to it to, to, to clean it out, right? It's like, I was afraid of breathing around it. It's horrifying. Uh, yeah, I think I may have thrown it away, exactly. Because here's, here's the problem, right? If you only clean the outside of a dirty dish, it doesn't do any good whatsoever, right? You gotta get down in there and clean the out, clean the inside of the bowl. If all you do is scrub the outside, you haven't cleaned it at all. And so just as a dirty dish that's clean on the outside and dirty on the inside is useless, so Jesus is saying those who say the right things, those who believe the right things, but they don't do the right things, it's equally useless. It's when Jesus tells this story that we heard this morning of a man who has two sons. He says to the first son, son, go and work in the vineyard today. The son says, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. And the father went to the second and said the same and answered, I go, sir. But he didn't go. So which of the two did the will of his father? And I urge you this morning to let this parable challenge you. Which of these two sons are you? Are you the one who says, yes, I will obey, but doesn't? If so, what Jesus is pointing out is that your profession of faith, your, your acknowledgement of the truth, your acknowledgement of your responsibility gets you absolutely nowhere. But there are those who have bad theology. There are those who even explicitly deny God, who reject God's law. But Jesus is saying those people are closer to heaven than you are. One month from now, one month from now, October 31st, 2017, will be the 500th anniversary to the day of the Protestant Reformation. Uh, it's fascinating. 500 years exactly we're at. And one of Martin Luther's slogans, we all know sola scriptura, the Bible alone, sola gratia, grace alone. He also taught sola fides, by faith alone, justification by faith alone. But isn't it interesting, I'm going to challenge you a little bit and push back this morning against Martin Luther, that the one and only time in Scripture that the expression faith alone occurs is in James chapter 2, verse 24, where the Bible says, You see then that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. The one time in the Bible where the expression faith alone is used, the Bible, Jesus' own brother, says, your justification is not by faith alone. No wonder then uh, Martin Luther had some problems with the book of James. Now, I think it's ironic that Seventh-day Adventists have a reputation uh, among other Protestants and evangelicals to be hung up on works. You knew this. You're familiar with this. That if you read a, a Protestant criticism of Seventh-day Adventism, what you'll often read is that Adventists ha have a hard time accepting justification by faith. That they believe that you're saved through Sabbath keeping or some kind of works, some kind of righteousness by works. But in my opinion, I think it's actually quite the other way around. 
the Adventism that I have seen growing up, uh, that I've seen all across the country, actually creates a culture where people think that they are saved precisely by what they believe, regardless of what they do. Certainly, I can't be the only one that has a friend or a family member who doesn't really live a Christian lifestyle. Maybe they don't really even make an effort to keep the Sabbath. But they know that the seventh day is the Sabbath. And they will fight to the end uh, to argue that point. And they think that just by knowing that, that that gives them some kind of leg up, right? That that gives them some kind of spiritual advantage. That makes them better than other Christians. Regardless of how they live, they know the truth. You see, Adventists have a tendency toward the heresy of Gnosticism. What is Gnosticism? The idea that salvation comes through knowledge. So many of us think that we'll be saved or that salvation is achieved by knowing that the seventh day is the Sabbath or knowing that death is an unconscious state or knowing this information that Jesus moved into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary in 1844. Knowing for Adventism has often been a point of emphasis. But the parable of Jesus this morning tells us that it is not about what we believe or what we say, it's about what we do. It's about how we live our lives. So this morning, I want to take the Sabbath as an example. And let's be clear about this. We're using this as an example of getting at the heart of the matter. We could talk about all kinds of different things, but I want to talk about the Sabbath this morning. Because when we go back to the laws of Moses, we can see very clearly that the Sabbath was introduced as a means of creating economic equality. Weekly Sabbaths allowed for the rest of workers. Yearly Sabbaths accommodated for the feeding of the poor. And the Sabbath of Sabbaths, the year of Jubilee, was the time in which all debts were canceled and all slaves were set free. And even in the Ten Commandments, the, the, the lesser quoted version of the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy 5, where God gives the Ten Commandments, it says this, Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. You see, the Sabbath commandment is tied forever with this idea of liberation from slavery because the Sabbath is a safeguard against returning to that brutal form of slavery from which Israel came. It's a safeguard against economic injustice. The Sabbath is a perpetual reminder to look after the poor. So no wonder then, when the Hebrew prophets come along and they see Israel mistreating the poor, they see Israel uh, failing to care for the needy, and so they tell the people of Israel, God hates your Sabbath. Through Amos, God says this, I hate, I despise your festivals. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps, but... Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. And again, through the prophet Isaiah, God says, The Sabbath and calling of convocation, I cannot endure it. Your appointed festivals my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. Why? Why is God so, so, so angry, so uh, detested by their Sabbath keeping. He says, cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, rescue the oppressed, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. You see, if you turn off your TV on Saturdays, if you come to church on Saturday morning and take a nap on Sabbath afternoon, but you don't seek justice, you don't rescue the oppressed, you don't defend the orphan, you don't plead for the widow, then what God is saying is that in his eyes, you're a Sabbath breaker. 
You're like the son who says to his father, I will go and work in the vineyard. But you don't. On the other hand, those who reject the Sabbath, those who say that every day is the same in God's eyes, that Sabbath keeping is not binding on Christians, but they care for the homeless, they clothe the naked, they defend the rights of the poor, then they're like the son who says to the father that even though he says he won't go, he has done it anyways. They might be rejecting the letter of the law, but they have understood the spirit of the law. They might say that they won't keep the Sabbath, but they are, in fact, Sabbath keepers. I encourage you, even this afternoon, to read Isaiah 58. To keep the Sabbath means to loose the bonds of injustice, to set the oppressed free, to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover them. So may God convict us this morning of our hypocrisy. May we be challenged to no longer rely on what we think we know and that we can uh, prepare for the last days by getting more information or by thinking that what we simply say we believe or that what we teach, that that's what makes us closer to God than anyone else. It's not about what you say. It's about what you do. As Christ says to us this morning, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For while the tax collectors and prostitutes may be sinners on the outside, they have no hypocrisy. They trust in God's good news of victory for the poor and justice for the oppressed. So, May this morning, may God cleanse us inside and out. May he equip us to serve him in word and in deed. And may we trust in God's promises, not just by our faith, but in our actions. Let's pray together this morning. Father God, your law is a challenge to us. What you have commanded us to do is sometimes difficult. But we pray for your Holy Spirit to change not just our external behaviors, not just to change our minds, but to change our hearts. Take away from us our hypocrisy. May we acknowledge before you with all honesty our guilt, our inadequacy. May we trust only in you to be our Savior and to transform us by your Holy Spirit. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen.